Hello and welcome. I'm Donna Cox from More Meadows. This is the first in a series of online talks and we are absolutely delighted that Professor Dave Gorton has agreed to give a talk for us tonight and that over 700 people have registered for it. I'd briefly like to say a few words about More Meadows for those joining us tonight who aren't familiar with our activities. More Meadows is a Dartmoor-based community group of some 800 landowners, farmers and gardeners who were restoring and creating flower-rich grasslands on every scale from meadows on shed roofs to acres of hay meadows. In fact, anyone who has a meadow knows that they bring life. The well-established um, meadows contain such an abundance and diversity of life. They really are some of our best wildlife habitat. We invite our members to add their meadow, no matter how small, to the Devon Meadows map, which can be found on our website. Um, and in total, there's uh, 1,098 acres of wildflower-rich meadows have been restored or are in the process of being restored or creative, created, much of it on Dartmoor, but now um, extending beyond. Um, and I'm pleased to say that we've just launched a new project funded by the Devon Environment Foundation, which is to support the formation of new meadows groups across Devon. Um, and to that end, we've created an online forum, the Meadow Makers Forum. Um, and that's really for anyone who's interested in, um, in, in meadows. Um, and meadow makers can communicate with each other, share information about their projects. We're recommending interesting links and books. Um, you can start discussions, ask a question, and have it answered by other forum members. Everything, in fact, that supports the establishment and management of wonderful wildflower habitat. Um, I'm sorry if there's um, some background echo I'm picking up, and I, I'm not quite sure where that's coming from. Hopefully, it won't be during Dave's talk as well. Um, what's really useful about the forum is um, that information isn't lost like it is on Facebook or even an email exchange. It's all archived, and um, topics are, are easily um, searchable. And I'm really hoping that in time um, that the forum will be like a one-stop shop um, for Meadows. Um, and we've just launched it in the new year um, and the first groups are already forming um, in South Devon, West Devon and the Blackdown Hills. And there is interest from East Devon, North Devon and Exmoor. Um, so please check out the forum. There's a link to it in the chat bar um, and you can also find the link on the More Meadows website. Um, if you search Meadow Makers Forum, it's so new, it's not being picked up yet by Google, um, but the uh, More Meadows website is easily found and the link to the forum is at the top of the, of the home page. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Tracy Hampton. Tracy's been working on the creation of the forum and talking to lots of people about it. Um, Tracy will now introduce Dave and run the Q&A session um, at the end. So, over to you, Tracy. Thanks, Donna. Sorry, I slightly prematurely cut you off there. Um, so, welcome, everybody. We've got a great talk lined up for you tonight. Um, we've got plenty of time at the end of the talk for questions. So, if I can just ask you to put your questions in the chat box next to the YouTube um, screen, that'd be great. And we'll get through as many of those as we can after the talk. If you're still in Eventbrite and you're viewing through the Eventbrite screen, you can click into the YouTube, which you'll need to, to do if you want to post questions. And you just click on the um, YouTube text down at the bottom right of the screen. So, hopefully, you're all all in and uh, ready to go. So as we know, insects are absolutely vital, not just for our survival, but for the functioning of life on Earth. And however, as we know as well, many of them are in drastic decline. But there are things that we can all do to start reversing that trend. And our speaker tonight, as Donna's already said, who will tell us more about that is Dave Golson, who's Professor of Biology at uh, the University of Sussex. Um, he's probably best known for his extensive knowledge on the behaviour and ecology of bumblebees, which he started studying in earnest over 25 years ago and has published more than 300 scientific articles on the ecology and conservation of bumblebees and other insects. 
Um, Dave's also the founder of the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, and he's a best-selling author of four books. Um, and probably many of you will be familiar with these, the first of which was The Sting in the Tail, which is about bumblebees. Um, and has now been translated into 15 languages. Um, this was followed by A Buzz in the Meadow, Bee Quest, and most recently, The Garden Jungle, or Gardening to Save the Planet. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome Dave. Thank you, Tracy and Donna, for the introductions, and, and thanks for inviting me to, to speak about insects. Um, which is it's a subject very close to my heart. It's, 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 uh, I've, as Tracy said, I've been studying insects for quite a long time now. And, uh, but I've always been fascinated by them um, since I was a little kid. Um, some of my earliest memories, I remember when I was about, um, I was only six or seven years old and, and I, I found these little yellow and black caterpillars on some weeds growing on the edge of the, the school playground. And, and I took them, Took, put them in my lunchbox and took them home and fed them and reared them up and eventually they turned into these beautiful um, black and red moths you might recognize from the description cinnabar moths and I just thought this was magic and I've been I've been obsessed by insects ever since really um, and I think lots of people go through a, a kind of bug phase um, but before I say more hang on, let me just share my screen just take me a second and hopefully we'll be seamless and painless there we go um so so this is my um my youngest son seth um with his pet cockchafer colin um sadly colin's no longer with us the photo was taken a couple of years ago but but seth is very much still in his bug phase he's absolutely obsessed and besotted with uh, uh, besotted with uh with insects he likes to hold them and look at them and watch them and feed them and, and all the rest of it. But the sad reality is that although some of us never grow out of this, most people do. And, and most people, by the time they're teenagers or adults, um, their response to, to something that buzzes or well, flies near them is, is fear. And they swat at it and they try and kill it because uh, they think it's going to bite them or sting them or something. It's obviously ignorance, really, but um, or lack of familiarity, at least, because many people grow up sort of without really encountering nature very much, sadly, these days. Anyway, my mission in life, I find it terribly sad that so many people really don't like insects. And so my mission in life is to try and persuade people to love them um, or at the very least to respect them, because insects are enormously important as i'm going to explain in a couple of minutes but um but before i do i just wanted to give you a sort of a bit more preamble um and i'm sorry if this is a bit obvious but it, it, it i think it's kind of important to have this in the back of your mind when listening to the rest of me rambling on um so this is our home fairly obviously i'm sure you recognize it um it's 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 and this astonishing thing, this rock hurtling through space with maybe as many as 10 million species of animal and plant clinging to its surface, including us. Um, it's, it's unique, it's amazing, it's a source of, it's our home, it's a source of food and water and clean, clean air, hopefully, and, and inspiration and beauty, it, it's everything. We're not gonna go and live on Mars anytime soon. And so I find it just bewildering that we're making such a mess of it, that we're not looking after our precious planet. And you're all aware of these issues, or at least you're, I'm sure you're aware of most of them. It's hard not to be these days, particularly climate change. Um, but climate change, uh, it, it gets the bulk of the attention, I guess, but it's only one of a plethora of interrelated environmental problems that we're creating, which are all becoming rapidly more acute. Things like soil erosion and we're polluting the soils and the seas and the air with plastics and heavy metals and pesticides and fertilizers and so on. And we're still chopping down the tropical forests and we're doing all sorts of stupid things that we ought to stop, uh, but we seem unable to stop ourselves. My real focus is on biodiversity loss at the bottom there. Um, scientists now all agree that we are in the midst of 
the sixth mass extinction event. Um, species are going extinct faster now than they have for 65 million years since the dinosaurs were, were wiped out by a meteor. This extinction event is unique because it's caused by a, a species on the planet, uh, us, of, of course. And it's, it's estimated that species are going extinct um, at perhaps a thousand times the average historic rate. And if that's true, then very crudely, um, it's estimated that about one species an hour somewhere on the planet is going extinct. So while I'm talking, something somewhere will disappear. And as we'll see in a minute, the chances are that's going to be some kind of insect. Now, so people, people focusing on biodiversity, they tend to, to extinction is, is I guess, the bulk of people's attention because it's such a, it's, it's so final, it's the end for a species. But actually, in a, in a, in a way, um, I think more worrying is the, the reduction in abundance that we've seen on planet Earth. Um, so some pretty reliable estimates from um, the Zoological Society of London suggest that, that since 1970, when I was five years old, we've lost 68% of um, wild vertebrates. So wild vertebrates is birds, mammals, fish, reptiles, and amphibians. Um, and so they are abundance, the number of individual animals has dropped uh, by 68% in less than my lifetime, which I, I find absolutely depressing, really. Anyway, people studying conservation and biodiversity tend to focus on larger creatures. And it's only really relatively recently that it's become apparent that the small things are also in trouble. Uh, and this, of course, brings us back to the insects. Um, and I think this really hit the fore of people's attention. Um, three years ago, four years ago now nearly, um, in 2017, when a study was published from Germany, which got media coverage all around the world. I was one of the authors, but I have to admit to having played a very minor role in this work. It's, it was uh, a study using malaise traps. That's a malaise trap top right there which German entomologists had put on nature reserves all across Germany since the late 1980s. And malaise traps catch flying insects, all types of insect. And what this chart shows you is the, the daily weight of insects caught um, per trap per day uh, between 1989 and 2016. And you can see it, it fell pretty dramatically. In fact, it fell the, the weight of insects caught per day fell by 76% in tw just 26 years. Um, and that, obviously that's, that's a staggeringly fast rate of decline. It suggests that something really profound and disturbing is happening with our insects. I, I could show you lots of other similar charts. It's, it's, we now know for certain that this is not something that's confined to Germany. Um, we have good data for, for only for certain insect groups and for certain parts of the world, but almost all of them are showing rapid declines. For example, butterflies and moths in the UK. But I won't depress you by showing you lots of lots of graphs all lurching downwards. What I do want to say is explain why this matters. So insects are really, really important, um, as was put quite nicely by um, E.O. Wilson, he's a bit of a hero of mine. He's uh, now well into his 90s. Um, he's a, a, an American scientist who specialised in study of ants, uh, particularly. Um, he, I won't read his whole quote out for you, but he basically said if people were to disappear from the planet, it would do very nicely without us. But if insects were to vanish, the environment would collapse into chaos, as he put it. And I think it's, it's obvious and that he was absolutely correct. And why is that? Why are insects so important? Well, firstly, insects make up the bulk of life on Earth. Um, so far, we've named about one and a half million species of animal and plant. I mentioned earlier that there may be as many as 10 million on the planet, but uh, we haven't got around to naming most of them yet. And we don't really know how many species we share our planet with, which is astonishing, really. Um, anyway, we've named about one and a half million, of which 1.1 million are different types of insect. So they are biodiversity, or at least they're, they're more than two thirds of it. But then they're also food for a very large proportion of the remainder 
of life on Earth. So, for example, most species of birds, also bats, uh, many reptiles, amphibians, freshwater fish, all feed upon insects, either throughout their lives or, or when they're young and need the protein. Um, and obviously, so this decline in insects is going to have knock-on effects for things that rely on insects for food. If you're a, one of these gorgeous bee eaters living in Germany, um, then 76% then of your food supply has vanished in just 26 years, and clearly that's, that's going to have an impact. But insects do many other things aside from just being food. Um, because they're so, so diverse, they're everywhere on land and in fresh water. Um, they're involved in more or less every ecological process you, you care to think of. They're vitally important biocontrol agents of crop pests. Um, they're recyclers of all sorts of organic materials from dead bodies to animal dung to trees and leaves and, and so on. They keep the soil healthy. They distribute seeds. They, you name it, they do it. They're involved, which is why E.O. Wilson said, you know, if the insects weren't there, then these processes, which are important, vital to the rest of life on Earth, would all stop happening. Of course, the thing that um, insects do that's most widely recognized is their pollinators. 87% um, of all the plant species in the world need pollinating by some kind of animal. And in a few instances, that's a hummingbird or a sunbird or a bat. Um, but 99% of the time, it's an insect of some type. Um, bees often get the, the sort of all the credit for pollination, but it's, we should remember that actually pollination is done by a whole host of of different insects, butterflies and moths, and lots of different species of flies and wasps and beetles and so on and so on. Just in the UK, it's estimated that there are about um, 4,000 at least different species of pollinating insects. And between them, they pollinate all of our wildflowers, which would disappear, of course, without them. And um, from a selfish human perspective, they pollinate three quarters of the crops that, that globally we grow. Um, so we're used to our supermarkets being sort of replete with this amazing selection of, of fruits and vegetables from all over the world. Um, but it wouldn't look so good if we didn't have, if we didn't have pollinating insects. Um, we wouldn't have apples or cherries or raspberries or strawberries or blueberries or tomatoes or squashes or chili peppers or even things like um, coffee and chocolate both depend on insect pollinators. So life would be pretty dire if we didn't have these little creatures. Um, and actually, um, I mean, the horrible truth is that millions of people would starve to death if we didn't have insect pollinators. So we, we absolutely have to look after them. We have to avoid ending up like, like these people. You've probably seen these pictures before that have been used many times. Um, uh, because they're they're both beautiful in in their kind of way, but also terribly chilling, really. Because they're pictures of people in southwest China um, hand pollinating the apple and pear orchards that grow there. Um, because there aren't any bees left, there aren't any pollinators left. Um, so the people, are, are sort of human bees, um, are doing the pollinating. Um, it's hard to imagine. You know, this is not a practical solution for humans to pollinate. Uh, crops and wildflowers into the future. Um, imagine a, a British farmer hand pollinating his field of oilseed rape. It's not really viable. So uh, we need to look after these little creatures. And to do that, we need to understand why they're declining. Um, and there are many reasons. There's no single cause of insect declines. Um, I've, I put what I think are the main ones in probably in some rough declining order um there but you could argue about the details um certainly loss of habitat both within the uk and globally has been a big one and i'll say a little bit more about that and pesticides are undoubtedly having an impact but there are many other drivers the spread of foreign diseases has really impacted on bees we know um, climate change is starting to to kick in um, there are issues with fertilizers and light pollution and and probably many other um things too to some degree, um, which I won't go into today. But let's just say a little tiny bit more about loss of loss of habitat, uh, which actually links into to, uh, 
um, the talk particularly I'm, I'm giving today, which is obviously organized by the Moore Meadow Project. Um, because from an insect perspective, the, the habitat loss, certainly in, in the UK, that has had the most profound impact uh, on insects has been the loss of our flower-rich meadows. Um, like this one, isn't that absolutely stunning? Um, I took that picture on South Uist in the Outer Hebrides in Scotland, but you can see very similar um, habitats with very similar flowers um, in in Devon, or, or and you used to be able to see them all over Britain. Um, uh, so a hundred years ago, uh, Britain had about seven million hectares of what scientists call flower-rich grasslands, but are better known as hay meadows or chalk downland. Um, seven million hectares, they were everywhere. Um, every, almost every farm would have had a, a hay meadow or two. Um, but sadly, in the, in, the, in the 20th century, well, actually between uh, 1930 and 1987, um, we lost, we destroyed 97% of this beautiful habitat um, and replaced it with um, this kind of habitat. Or, um, so this is obviously an arable crop. Um, in, in terms of biodiversity, um, th there is essentially almost zero biodiversity here. Whereas of course, in this habitat, it's teeming with plant species with all sorts of different insects and birds and so on. Um, or from a, uh, the perspective of someone based in the Southwest of Britain, um, those meadows have mostly been turned over to, to this kind of habitat, um, improved grassland as it's, as it's normally termed um, in farming. Um, much of the west of Britain is bright green these days. Um, and slightly worryingly, I think a lot of people from the cities, people who don't know better, might look at this landscape and think, oh, that's beautiful. I bet that's full of wildlife. Um, that that's what the countryside looks like, isn't it? Um, but actually this this kind of habitat is almost devoid of life this isn't much more diverse than that arable field i showed you on the previous slide these, these reseeded pastures treated with lots of fertilizers have very very low botanical diversity often no flowers at all and support negligible insect life or any other kind of life sadly in fact the landscape has really changed quite profoundly in the last um few decades in ways that I don't think are, are widely appreciated. Um, people think that the, the landscape today is what the countryside should look like because that's what they've grown up with or what they can remember. Um, but actually the landscape has been changing and uh, I think that's really nicely illustrated by these, these photographs which aren't admittedly from the UK but I think the pattern's been very similar here. So these are these are four photographs taken from aeroplanes over exactly the same place um, in, um, uh, in Western France. And uh, top, top left was taken in, um, if I remember correctly, I think that's 1958. And bottom right was the most recent photograph taken in 2010. And um, as you can see, uh, the, the, the landscape has changed really quite profoundly in that um, 50 year period. It's gone from a landscape made up of hundreds of tiny little fields with a rich diversity of crops and some of them would have been fallow um, and look at it in, in 2010, just a few giant fields. Um, and you can sort of intuitively see straight away why um, biodiversity has declined when you look at those pictures. The landscape is just so much more homogenous and boring than it used to be. And it didn't used to look like that. We, you know, within 1958 is a few years before I was born, but not that much. Within my lifetime, the landscape has really profoundly changed. Of course, some parts of the world that do this on a much bigger scale than, than we do. Um, if you think our fields are big, then look at some of those in North America where they really have absolutely transformed the landscape to support, to provide food for humans, but at what cost to the environment? Of course, it's not just not just um, uh, developed countries doing that. Developing countries are also busy transforming biodiverse habitats into monocultures. I'm sure you probably can recognise what this is: the dreaded palm oil spreading across. Uh, this is a photo taken from Indonesia, 
um, vast areas of incredibly biodiverse rainforest are being replaced with a single species, essentially palm oil, um, so that we can eat peanut butter and the like. Um, it's utterly depressing. Anyway, that's habitat loss. I won't say any more about it. I just want to say a tiny bit more about pesticides, and I have a feeling this might come up in any questions at, at the end because it's kind of there's been some topical pesticide-related issues in the last few days. Um, but broadly, this switch in habitat and this intensification of farming, the move to bigger fields, to more mechanization, to fewer crops, um, is also been strongly associated with a, with a steady increase in, in use of chemicals, both fertilizers um, to boost crop growth and a whole plethora of pesticides. Uh, I could talk for hours about this because it's something that I've been studying for the last 12 years. Um, and I don't, I, 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 I'll spare you, but just some broad, broad figures. Um, British farmers um, at the last government census applied 16.9 thousand tonnes of pesticides to the UK. Um, and that's a mix of, of fungicides, herbicides, molluscicides to kill slugs and snails, insecticides, of course, to kill insects. Um, and each field on average gets treated 17.4 times. That could be, it's a bit complicated to explain, but that could be the same pesticide being sprayed 17.4 times. Or it could be a farmer mixing 17 pesticides and spraying them all at once, or, uh, or some combination in reality, some, somewhere between the two. But that figure, 17.4, is has risen by 70% since um, uh, 1990. So farmers are spraying more often by far than they used to be. This is a problem that's getting steadily worse, not better. Um, and it's, there's no doubt at all that it's contributing to, to this, poor things, to, to the decline of insects. So um, that's all a bit doom and gloom. Let's, let's now turn to some more cheerful stuff. So there is good news here, believe it or not. Um, a lot of the, the big environmental issues I, I mentioned at the beginning are really depressing. You know, you feel absolutely helpless, don't you, when you turn on the television and you see these photographs of the Amazon on fire or, or the walruses falling off cliffs. I don't know if any of you saw that, but uh, it had me in tears. And, uh, um, and you just feel completely, you know, what on earth can I do? But the great news is here that, that we, insects mostly haven't gone extinct. The large majority of insect species, so far as we know, are still with us. And they can breed and recover really quickly. And we can all get involved in looking after them because they live all around us. They're in our gardens. They're just outside the window behind me. Um, they're in our parks. They're, they're, they're everywhere. So we can all get involved. We can all do things. And they might seem small, but if we all do them, or if millions of people do them, then that's big. Um, so I'm going to talk about two broad areas where I think we need to, to, to take action to look after insects. And the first one is perhaps the most obvious one, which is what we can all do in our gardens. I know not everybody has a garden, um, but even a window box, if you grow the right flowers in it, um, will attract and feed some bees, no matter where you are, even, even on the 10th floor of a tower block in a city center. So everyone can do something. But if you have a garden, you can do a lot. Um, there's a really interesting study um, published as a book by a lady called Jenny Owen, a few years ago now, um, she spent um, 35 years cataloging the insect life, or sorry, cataloging the all life in her garden. And she had a little eighth of an acre garden in urban Leicester in, in the city. Um, but over 35 years, she managed to, to, to identify 2,600 different species of animals and plants, of which about 2,000 were different types of insects. So there's an extraordinary biodiversity living right under our noses, if only we sort of stop to pay attention to it. Um, but obviously there's, there's always potential to be more. And I think there's a huge opportunity, a bit of an open door right now, because people want, lots of people already want to make their gardens more wildlife friendly, more insect friendly to help the bees and the butterflies and the birds and so on. There's a real appetite there. And there are 
22 million gardens in the UK, covering an area of nearly half a million hectares. It's a bigger area than all of our nature reserves. So just imagine um, if they were all full of insect-friendly flowers, free of pesticides and all the things I'm going to touch on in a minute. Um, that's an amazing uh, a patchwork of habitat and it could be linked up because if we change the way we manage road verges and roundabouts and, and city parks and uh, cemeteries and all these other habitats that are, that are um, owned by the local authority, then there's, in, there's more potential. Um, and we could create a network of, of insect-friendly habitat right across the country. As you can tell, I'm quite excited about this and think there's, there's huge potential here. So I wrote a book about it. So I always plugging my own books. Bear with me. Um, but of course, gardening isn't necessarily good for the environment. Um, gardens can be like Jenny Owens, teeming with life or, or not so much. Um, as this photograph shows, gardening can be both good and bad. And I think we need to recognize that and be aware of what the bad looks like. Now, this is an extreme example, of course. This, I don't know whether you can tell, but that's plastic grass and hard paving and almost zero life. Um, I, I saw today, I actually saw an advert, you can now buy plastic wisteria to pin to the front of your house. Flowers all year round, of course, what's not to like. Um, you, you can have a garden which both supports no biodiversity at all and is created at huge environmental cost, all the uh, fossil fuels required to create the plastics and, and so on. It's utterly depressing. Um, of course, this is this. I'm sure nobody listening tonight has a garden that looks anything like that. Um, but we are all of us, I'm sure, uh, certainly those of us that have gardens, guilty of doing some things that aren't so good for the environment. So you go to your local garden centre and um, you know, they have this amazing selection of flowers that you, know, you get a big trolley and you, you fill it up with beautiful plants. Um, unfortunately, probably um, plants grown in a peat-based compost, certainly sold in disposable plastic pots, probably imported from abroad, um, almost certainly drenched in pesticides. And this is something we've studied. Um, we, we screened plants being sold by garden centres as perfect for pollinators using that logo at the bottom right, which is a common marketing strategy, tapping into the demand from the public for plants that are good for bees and butterflies and so on. And we screen them for pesticides and, and um, you'll perhaps not be surprised to hear they're all full of pesticides. Virtually everything we screened had pesticides in it. 75% of the bee friendly plants we looked at had insecticides in the pollen and nectar. 70% had neonicotinoid insecticides in the pollen and nectar. Um, this was three years ago. It may not be the case anymore because they've been more or less banned. Um, but anyway, so you buy all these plants full of pesticides grown in peat in disposable plastic pots, and you might add a sack of uh, fertilizer and a sack of compost, most of them peat based. Um, uh, and perhaps some bottles of pesticide and off you go to the counter. Well, that obviously is not very green. In fact, far from it. There's a whole bunch of different environmental impacts there. And yet we've all probably done something a bit like that at some point or other. So that's the kind of downside of gardens, gardening. It can involve lots of chemicals and goods and, and consumerism at, at its kind of worst. Uh, a big environmental footprint for not necessarily much benefit or indeed possibly harm. But it can be amazing. Um, gardens can be wonderful, as I've already mentioned. Uh, so how do we make them more wonderful? Well, the most obvious thing to do is to um, select the right flowers. This is probably the first thing you think of if you're thinking of making a garden insect friendly or bee friendly in particular. Bees obviously like some flowers more than others. And there's, there's, there's a reason for that, um, or part of the reason relates to the way we've tinkered with flowers over the decades. So all flowers evolved to feed, uh, to, to, pollin to attract pollinators. Um, that's what a flower is for. It's not to look pretty, obviously. It's not there for us. Um, it's there, those colored petals, the scent and the nectar reward are there to attract uh, a bee or a butterfly or a hummingbird or whatever it might be. 
Um, but we've played around with flowers. Plant breeders have played around with flowers, trying to make them more attractive to people. And sometimes, unfortunately, have made them less attractive or entirely unattractive to pollinators. And these are this is one of the things we often do is we've selected for double varieties of flowers. Um, now, these are mutants where um, typically the anthers, which are the male parts of the flower that normally produce the pollen, have mutated into extra petals. So you might think that the three plants along the top look pretty, um, but from a bee's perspective, they're abominations because they don't have any pollen and you can't get to the nectar because there's this great mass of fluffy petals in the way. Whereas the, the, the more wild type, the more natural flowers that they came from along the bottom, um, which actually I personally think are prettier as well, um, are fantastic for, for bees. So avoid double varieties and more generally avoid intensively bred annual bedding plants. Um, these sorts of things you see stuck outside the front of supermarkets and DIY stores and whatever in, in March and April for you to throw in the car um, and brighten up your garden. But most of them are actually pretty useless um, for insect life. So get rid of those. And more broadly, head towards traditional cottage garden flowers and herbs. Uh, all of them tend to be pretty good um, for wildlife. Now, I could talk for hours about all the different plants that you could grow in a garden, and there are hundreds and hundreds of species that are insect friendly. Um, and obviously, we haven't got time for that. But there's lots of advice out there, um, including YouTube videos from me, if you don't want to spend any money, um, which will show you at least some of the, the, the plants that I grow that are wildlife friendly. So check those out if you want more information. One thing you will find is that many books and online sources will tell you which plants are good for pollinators. But often they're, they're a bit vague. So they might say, for example, that catmint or lavender are good for bees. And that's broadly true. Um, but actually, there are many different varieties of catmint and lavender and almost all um, uh, ornamental plants that you might buy. And some are much better for others. And often, actually, no research has been done to establish which are the best. But for some plant uh, species, that has been done. So, for example, um, catmint, uh, there was a trial done by um, another research group at Sussex University, nothing to do with me, um, where they looked at different catmint varieties to see which ones attracted the most bees. And they found that Six Hills Giant happens to be the best performing variety. And, and it's, it's four to five times better than the worst performing variety in terms of numbers of insects attracted. So it's worth knowing which ones are best. Similarly, uh, the same group studied lavender and found that this, this species, uh, Gros Bleu, was the, was the best performing. So next time you're buying a lavender, don't just buy any old lavender, but try and find one of these if you can. So because this all gets a bit complicated and you might be feeling a bit uh, out of your depth or think, how do I remember? How do I find out which ones I need? So I've written another book. I'm sorry to keep doing this. This comes out in April and it basically contains all the information I could find pulled together about exactly which are the very best things you might grow in your garden and other things you can do in your garden too to encourage bumblebees and other pollinators. You can pre-order it already from uh, uh, websites like Waterstones and so on. Okay, so those are kind of ornamental flowers um, that you might uh, include in your garden. I'd also urge everybody to be more tolerant of what are usually called weeds. So um, uh, it, it's kind of odd really, isn't it? If you think about it, that we spend ages and lots of money trying to cultivate certain plants. And then we spend also an equal amount of time um, and sometimes money trying to get rid of other plants. And actually, if you just stop and look at them for a minute, you might suddenly realize that the ones you've been trying to get rid of are just as pretty as the ones you've been trying to grow. Um, so these are all flowers um, from my garden um, and probably most many gardens, um, dandelions, of course, ragwort, um, spear thistle. Um, all of them actually rather beautiful, I think, and really, really good plants for pollinators. So um, if we could just be a little more tolerant and allow a bit of space for some of these, and uh, ragwort actually, I grow in a, 
in in my kind of ornamental herbaceous flower bed um and it, it doesn't take over it uh, it flowers for ages it looks beautiful and it attracts so many insects it's fantastic um so it's it's, it's um I, I, one of my top, my top tips, if you like, is that you can get rid of all the weeds in your garden, just like that, just by calling them all wildflowers. Isn't that easy? Okay, flowering trees are also great if you've got room. I know many people have small gardens and a flowering tree might seem not much of an option. You certainly, if you've got a small garden, can't plant a horse chestnut or a lime tree. Um, but if you can squeeze in a flowering tree, they're fantastic because because they're so three-dimensional, they can carry many, many more flowers than the same area of flower bed would be able to support. Um, and if you've got a small garden, actually, you don't give up hope because there are small flowering trees. Uh, things like laburnums are quite small. Or when it comes to fruit trees, um, which are, are almost all fantastic for pollinators, um, you can get ones on dwarfing rootstock so that you can buy apple trees that only grow about four feet tall um, and small enough you can grow them in a pot on a patio. Um, and I, admittedly, that's not going to support too many pollinators, but uh, anything is, is better than nothing. And planting trees also, of course, has other advantages. It's, they support a lot of wildlife. Generally, they help to hold the soil together. Um, as they grow, they're locking up carbon. And if they're fruit trees, they provide you with fruit. So the wind's all round, really. Another area where, where there's often scope for making uh, 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 the garden more friendly for insect life is when it comes to our lawns. Um, now, a lot of British people are slightly obsessed by trying to recreate something that looks a bit like a Wimbledon tennis court in their, in their garden. My dad, sadly, is one of those people. I've, he's, he's, he's 88 and he's still trying to get stripes in his lawn. Um, I don't really know why we're so obsessed with we I guess we are all kind of neat freaks up to a point. Um, uh, but if you just relax, actually it's surprising how many flowers are already in most lawns. Um, uh, this is my lawn and I didn't, um, I haven't sown any wildflowers in it at all. This is just the lawn at the back of my house. Uh, if you don't mow it, which obviously I don't terribly often, um, it just bursts into flower. This is red clover, white clover, self heal buttercups dandelions um speedwells there's all sorts of lovely little flowers in there I've, it's basically an instant wildflower meadow in my garden just waiting to spring into life if i stop mowing it uh, and lots of people have have that um uh, so if we if we could just persuade people you know instead of being so kind of um keen on that kind of Wimbledon tennis court or croquet lawn approach, next time they get the urge to mow, just try and calm down and get the deck chair out, make themselves a coffee, make a gin and tonic or whatever, and, and sit down and take a deep breath and, and relax and, and watch, the, watch the flowers unfold and the butterflies and bees come zooming in. Um, far more rewarding than pushing a mower up and down or probably sitting on one these days. You might be tempted if you've got a, want to create something full of flowers like this in your garden. And maybe you've got a, a modern lawn, which was seeded recently, which is very, it doesn't have any flowers in it. Um, you might be tempted, you can buy roll out instant meadows these days. So bottom left is what they look like. Quite expensive, but they, they're, they're pre-grown with a, with a lovely diversity of meadow flowers. And that's quite attractive, but just be slightly wary because most of the ones on the market are grown through a plastic mesh it makes them easier to roll up and the background picture in this shot shows you uh, what one of these looked like a couple of years after it was laid it's clearly perhaps it wasn't managed beautifully for the flowers um, but the mesh is coming through and it's almost impossible to remove i'm told so so just keep an eye out for that if you want to uh, tempted by a, an instant fix roll out meadow try and find one that isn't impregnated with plastic of course, as well as in our gardens, there are lots of um, grassland areas, amenity grasslands or mown grasslands in urban areas that are council owned, um, road verges, roundabouts and, and cemeteries and so on. Um, parks often have huge areas of mown grass. And of course, you know, people need mown areas to play football or whatever. But most of it doesn't have to be like that. It could be more like this. So... Uh, 
this is a picture taken in Stirling in Scotland, which is a, a place I used to work actually. Um, and it shows a, a, a road verge that used to be, well, you can see what it used to look like because on the far side of the road, that, that's it, mown grass. Um, but it was, it, there's, a, there's a little campaign group, they call themselves On The Verge. Um, uh, they've got that, you see this rather strange logo with a sl slightly psychotic looking B on it. Um, but they're lovely people doing amazing stuff. They um, basically, it's a group of volunteers that spend their weekends so, uh, digging over any bit of amenity grassland they can get their hands on and sowing it with wildflowers. And at the last count, um, there are 93 patches like this dotted around Stirling. Um, this is a road verge and there's a roundabout, but they've also got a, a primary school field, the edge of a rugby pitch, um, uh, even it, it, one inside a prison, um, which I, I mean, it's just, just fantastic. And imagine if every, every roundabout in Britain was covered in flowers like that, wouldn't that be absolutely fantastic? When it comes to managing urban areas, the absolute sort of antithesis, the opposite of that is this. Um, and this is something we really need to push to stop happening, I think. This kind of wanton destruction. I, you, sorry, I should backtrack a tiny bit because perhaps not everybody knows what this is, although I, I would guess most of you do. Um, so th this was a, a little tiny patch of vegetation clinging onto a little rectangle of soil around a silver birch tree. Um, uh, and you know, it probably wasn't terribly exciting, probably mostly grass, it's hard to tell now, because someone from the local council has come along with a, a sprayer and sprayed it, probably with glyphosate, certainly with herbicide of some sort, and has killed the whole lot. Why? What harm was that bit of grass doing? Is it? I guess it's just deemed it was untidy. But does this look better? It certainly doesn't to me, it looks hideous. So again, if we could just be a little more tolerant of, of life growing in and around us in our cities, um, that could make a big difference. As obviously, this, this is a small patch, but there are a lot of these small patches and many urban areas that are, have guys on quad bikes with big tanks on the back employed by the council to basically spray and kill anything green that tries to survive on our pavements. And this is... Um, Aside from the, the, the impact on wildlife, there's, there's, there are other concerns here, actually. Um, so, the, the, of course, the, the herbicide of choice these days is, is glyphosate, or Roundup is its common name, as it were, and um, glyphosate is the proper name. Um, it's sprayed on the edges, of, it's um, on paths in parks, on the edges of children's playgrounds. It's, it's the most widely used uh, pesticide in the world. Um, and... Um, it's really nasty stuff. There's a lot of evidence now that it's harmful to the soil and bees, uh, and a, a pretty large body of evidence suggesting that it causes cancer in humans. Um, there have been some prominent court cases in the America, in, in the US in recent years, which the plaintiffs have won uh, very large amounts of money from um, Monsanto, who manufactured this chemical. Um, but we continue to spray it all over our, our towns, um, all over our parks, where our children play, where our dogs sniff and so on. It seems absolutely insane to me. So let's try and be a bit more tolerant and push for your local town or authority to be pesticide free. There are pesticide free cities already in, uh, in the world. Um, Toronto went pesticide free nearly 20 years ago. France recently went completely pesticide free in its urban areas. Um, if they can do it, we can do it. Relating to which, in your garden, I would really urge you not to use pesticides. You, you just don't need them in a, in a garden, um, particularly for, for pest control, for, um, for controlling aphids and the like. Um, I find it terribly sad that some people, as soon as they see a couple of aphids on their roses or on their runner beans, drive to the garden centre and buy a, a, a bug gun of some sort like those here. Um, I, these are poisons that you're spraying on, on potentially on your vegetables or on the flowers in your garden. Um, actually, the reality is if you just do nothing and leave the aphids be, usually within a few days, um, a whole army of insects come galloping over the hill to eat them for you. So you don't need to do anything at all. And these are all um, predators of aphids, uh, which are all quite common in, in gardens. There are many more as well. 
I often have a few aphids in my garden. I see it as a good thing because that means there's food for these creatures. And if, if, if you let them do their job uh, and you don't kill them accidentally by spraying your roses or runner beans or whatever it might be, uh, then they keep the aphids under control naturally and you get a healthy crop or lots of roses and everyone's happy. You just don't need to spray. And worst case scenario, supposing these creatures don't turn up to your aid and you end up with a bit of an infestation of aphids on your runner beans. Is that really the end of the world? That doesn't seem like it to me. I'd much rather that than poison my garden. Speaking of which, um, one other pesticide related issue to warn you of, which you may be aware of because it's been in the news again recently, um, is that, that many of us are, are garden organically, um, but lots of us have dogs or cats um, and our vet will have advised us to treat them against fleas. Um, the commonest flea treatment in use in the UK is this one, Advocate, uh, closely followed by Advantage, which is a similar product. Um, and you're supposed to drip this stuff on the back of the neck of your dog prophylactically, even if it doesn't have fleas, your vet will advise you to do this to prevent it from getting, it's like taking antibiotics to, to avoid getting ill. It's, it's a ridiculous idea. Anyway, the active ingredient here, I don't know whether you can see my mouse, but I'm just going to hover it over uh, the tiny word imidacloprid there. That's a type of neonicotinoid insecticide. Uh, that's a chemical that was banned in farming for farming use in 2018, um, but it's still perfectly legal to drip it on your family pet. Uh, it's, it's a neurotoxin. It's incredibly poisonous to insect life. It's the kind of the equivalent of Nobachok for, for bees. Um, one teaspoon of this stuff is enough to kill one and a quarter billion honeybees. The dose, the monthly dose on a medium sized dog is enough to kill 60 million honeybees. Um, and it's water soluble and quite persistent. So you put it on your dog, your dog goes out in the garden in the rain or goes for a swim in the local pond. Um, and that's a huge dose of insecticide going straight into the environment, which is not good. We recently found, uh, published a paper just a few weeks ago. Um, oh, I see it's not formally even out yet, 10th of February, anyway. Um, uh, where we found that these products are regularly turning up in, in English rivers, um, often at, at, at concentrations many times higher than the safe limit for, um, for aquatic insect life. Um, so almost certainly poisoning our rivers by trying to treat our dogs uh, against fleas, which is quite sad, really. Anyway, moving on to more cheerful things. A um, couple of little things you can do in your garden to, to just add a, a little bit more biodiversity. So you've got a lawn full of flowers, um, you've got beds full of flowers, maybe some flowering trees, they're all pesticide free. Uh, the only other thing you can do to, to make your garden even more bee friendly is to stick up a bee hotel um, or make a bee hotel. Um, bee hotels are aimed at some of the solitary bees that uh, so they're not honeybees or bumblebees, but bees that uh, that live on their own. A female just nests uh, on her own, stocks a nest with pollen, lays her eggs. Um, there's no workers, no queens, and so on. And some of these solitary bees like to nest in hollow tunnels, um, and it's really easy to provide homes for them. But that ugly thing on the left there is an old, rather rotten fence post in my garden, which I just got to drill and drilled a bunch of holes in, about eight millimeter diameter. Uh, and, and it doesn't look great, but within 20 minutes of starting drilling, um, I had my first uh, resident uh, come to, in, or at least my first inspection from one of these red mason bees, top right, which are the most common uh, bees to uh, use these things. They're out in fa fairly soon, isn't that a nice thought? The spring isn't so far away. They're out in late March uh, through to about June. And then in, in summer, you get, if there are any holes left, they might be occupied by leafcutter bees. And there's a leafcutter bee bottom right, which line the tunnels with little snippets of leaves that they cut. And it's rather beautiful to watch. Uh, you can have something much prettier than my ugly fence post. Um, great projects for the kids, you know, something to do with the kids during lockdown. Make a bee hotel. I've made a YouTube video about that too. Um, sawing up bits of bamboo, drilling holes in blocks of wood. There's lots of different ways you can you can do it. Or if you're completely hopeless at DIY, you can buy one. There's lots of different designs out there. Most of them work reasonably well. 
this is one of my favorites. This is from a company called Nurturing Nature that uh, uh, make ones with windows on the side. So you can see the, the developing bees in, inside. That's the picture on the right there. Um, really cute and great way of engaging people and kids in particular with, uh, you know, they, my, my youngest, Seth, that I showed you at the beginning, he loves peeking in every few days in the summer to see how the, uh, the bees are doing. You could also try making a hoverfly lagoon, um, which is a, a much less well-known um, sort of uh, enhancement for the wildlife in your garden. Um, there are, hoverflies are, are, are important pollinators and some of them have larvae that are important uh, predators of aphids, but others have aquatic larvae. Um, they, they lay their eggs um, in small puddles uh, filled with organic matter um, and that's where the larvae live. And you can recreate a habitat for them very, very easily. All you need is some kind of waterproof container, a bucket, an old saucepan, even a, a plastic milk bottle chopped in half, use the bottom half, um, fill it with water, chuck in some leaves, some lawn clippings. Um, another YouTube video on this. <laughs> and, uh, and wait, and usually within just a few days, as the organic material starts to ferment a bit, it attracts these beautiful flies. You can see the females on the right there. They lay their eggs, which hatch into, well, so the maggots themselves, maggots, and that's just not a word that sounds attractive. And unfortunately, the common name is rat-tailed maggot, which sounds even worse. But they're really quite fascinating there. There's, you see one in the top center. Um, uh, the, the reason they have the tail it's a snorkel, so that the larvae itself would be a tasty snack for a passing bird. So it lives as deep as it can get where it can't be seen, and it sends its tail up, which is telescopic, up to the surface so that it can breathe. Uh, really cool, and again, actually pretty good for children's entertainment. You can make yourself a hoverfly lagoon and get the kids to see how successful it is and count the rat-tailed maggots as they accumulate. Okay, so I've talked at length about gardening and how we can make our gardens more wildlife friendly. I've got 10 minutes to finish off by saying a little bit more about uh, the other thing which I think we need to do if we really want to turn around insect declines, which is change the way we grow food. Um, unfortunately, we can do a lot with gardens, but farmland covers 70% of the United Kingdom. Um, and globally, the way we grow food is the biggest driver of biodiversity loss. And I think we've kind of, sadly, most people, without really thinking about it, have just accepted industrial uh, agriculture as, as the only way we can feed everybody. We all know the human population is large and is growing, and maybe get to 10, 11, 12 billion by 2050. Um, and, and so therefore, many people, I think, assume that we just have to it's a necessary evil industrial farming to feed everybody but actually i would argue the opposite i think if we carry on down this route people will starve because this isn't sustainable long term food production contributes about a third of all greenhouse gas emissions globally and we absolutely can't carry on doing that we all know we need to massively cut down on greenhouse gas emissions so that has to change um it the, it's a massive driver of soil erosion. Um, recent estimates suggest we're losing 24 billion tonnes of topsoil from the earth every year. And that's, that's more than three tonnes per person. That's really depressing. Uh, if we don't have any soil, we're not going to be able to grow crops. Yeah, and on top of that, um, of this, this is, as I've already said, is one of the biggest drivers of biodiversity loss, which means we're losing the natural enemies of crop pests and we're losing the pollinators. And if we don't have pollinators, then we're not going to be able to grow food successfully. So we can't carry on, I don't think. We need to find better ways. And actually, there are better ways, which I'll come to in a second. But before I do, there are a couple of other points I need to make. One is, is that there is no food shortage in the world. If you look at total numbers of calories produced, um, we grow about three times as many calories as we need to feed the world. Um, but unfortunately, we waste about a third of that food. Uh, a third of all the food grown isn't consumed by anybody or anything. Um, and then we feed another third to animals, which is just not an efficient way of 
feeding people. I'm not arguing you should be vegan or, or vegetarian. I do eat meat. I just eat it occasionally and see it as a treat. Unfortunately, meat consumption per capita in the world is, is, is rising rapidly and we can't afford to, for everybody to eat more and more meat because it just doesn't stack up as an efficient way of feeding people, unfortunately. So we waste too much food, we eat more meat than is good for the environment or that is good for us, in fact. And we also eat too much. Sorry, this is a horrible picture. Um, I do apologise. Um, but we do, we have a global epidemic of obesity. Um, in the UK, 27% of adults are obese. And by total coincidence, a recent government estimate suggested that Obesity is costing the economy £27 billion pounds a year, so really serious money, basically because we eat too much, uh, far more than we need to, and we eat the wrong kinds of food. So we have an agriculture system which is largely globally produces uh, grains and oil crops in huge abundance um, and nowhere near enough fruit and veg, so actually there aren't, although there's three times as many calories grown as we actually need to feed everybody, there aren't enough fruit and veg grown in the world. Uh, were they shared out fairly and equally between all the human beings, there wouldn't be enough for us all to have a healthy diet uh, because we don't grow enough fruit and veg, basically. But we grow way too much wheat, rice, maize and so on, which means we end up with a diet that looks like this, uh, very um, processed carb based, and we don't eat enough fruit and veg. So there are lots of problems with the way we currently grow and feed the world. It's hugely inefficient and wasteful. We don't need to farm as much if we were clever about what we grew and how we grew it. Um, so what should a farming system look like to be properly sustainable? Well, I, I, sustainable is the very first property it has to have. It can't be destroying soils, wiping out bees and so on. Uh, if you can't continue to do it indefinitely, we shouldn't be doing it at all. So it needs to look after the soil rather than damaging the soil uh, and be locking up carbon in the soil rather than releasing carbon from the soil. Um, whatever way we farm, it has to work with nature rather than against it. It has to support biodiversity. So there are lots of natural enemies to control the crop pests rather than having to spray them with pesticides. And so there are lots of pollinators to pollinate the crop if it's a a flowering crop and of course it needs to be a farming system that produces that uh, the, the food that is good for us a diverse and healthy diet for humans as i've written it there um and that sounds like quite a wish list but actually the odd thing is that it's perfectly possible and the reason i, I got interested in this whole area was from some research i was doing on allotments around brighton um we looked at the productivity of allotments to start with. Um, we got, we got um, allotment holders to, to weigh everything they produced for a year. Um, and we were astonished how much food the good, the, the sort of more competent allotmenters were producing. Um, so, so the best we had was, was over 40 tonnes per hectare of fruit and veg produced um, uh, so I should say an allotment is much smaller than a hectare, but if you scale it up to a per hectare measure, um, some of these allotments were getting 40 tonnes of mixed fruit and veg. That's zero food miles, zero packaging, healthy fruit and veg available for kind of immediate local consumption. And if you compare that to, say, wheat production, which gives about eight tonnes per hectare or oilseed rape production, which is about three and a half tonnes per hectare, it stacks up really well. So they're surprisingly productive. But then at the same time, there was a, a, a big national study of urban biodiversity from Brist but scientists based at Bristol University, which found that um, allotments are the most biodiverse uh, parts of urban areas, more so than, um, than gardens or parks or even city nature reserves. So you can produce lots of food and have high biodiversity in the same place. They don't have to be mutually exclusive in the way that they've become. Um, and on top of that, actually, a couple of other interesting things. There's a separate study showed that allotments of rich, the soil is really rich in carbon, it's storing lots of carbon, which is great. And a study from the Netherlands showed that allotmenters tend to be healthier 
the non-allotmenters, which is really fascinating. Is it because they grow and eat lots of fruit and veg? Is it because they get exercise? Is it some social aspect of going out to the allotment and chatting to their neighbours? Nobody knows the answer. But if it's good for people's health and it's good for locking up carbon in the soil and it supports biodiversity and it produces food, there's something interesting here that we should look into. But actually, there are already types of scaled up farming which, look, which operate on similar uh, principles. Things like agroforestry, incorporating perennial crops, trees and shrubs, uh, that may be producing fruit or timber or locking up nitrogen in the soil um, alongside more traditional arable crops uh, shows real promise, I think, as does permaculture or biodynamic farming. I don't know if you've come across this, but it's a, it's a really interesting approach that uh, um, uh, was, was pioneered by Rudolf Steiner about 100 years ago. And it includes kind of elements of almost witchcraft. They make potions and the like, but actually most of what they do, 99% of it is incredibly sensible. They look after the soil. They don't use any pesticides. They encourage natural enemies. They encourage pollinators. They grow a huge diversity of crops and it works. They produce loads of food in a way that actually also supports biodiversity. And I, I'd love it if we could do more farming like this and less of that intensive farming with lots of sprays. Whatever we do, we have to make a better job of looking after our planet. Um, as I said at the beginning, you know, this is this is everything to us. We don't have, there is no planet B. And I find it really bizarre that people would would do anything for their children or their grandchildren, apart from apparently leave them a decent planet to live on. And we have to do better than that. And, and we can. And I think a great place to start is by looking after the insects that live all around us. Thank you, everybody, for listening. 59 minutes, I make it. Uh, spot on. I'll just stop sharing my screen now. Tracy, you're muted. Thanks for that. <laughs> Thanks very much, Dave. I'm just saying we've got lots and lots of questions. There's a few general themes that we've picked out, but there's all sorts of lively discussion about um, same wild flower seeds and all sorts of things. So um, um, we'll take a look. So we kind of right at the beginning when you were talking about pollinators um, we had a question from Laura who was quite interested to hear you talk about wasps as pollinators um, she hadn't really realized that they were very useful at all and wondered if you could elaborate a bit on the uses of wasps oh of course um I mean actually so so I'm I, I before I talk about wasps um people <laughs> And say something like you know what's the point of wasps what's the point of slugs what's the point of mosquitoes and i i would turn it around and say well you know the our default setting should be things don't need to have a point for us to allow them to exist you know they've got wasps have got as much right to be here as we have as far as i'm concerned so the, does there have to be a point i don't know but actually in the case of wasps there is a point um, or several points because they're really important biocontrol agents in most of the year they're predators um, and they eat aphids and caterpillars off our cabbages and, and so on uh, to take back to feed to their grubs. Um, and they're pollinators. Uh, later in the year, they get a bit of a sweet tooth. And so if you look, for example, at ivy when it flowers, you'll see hundreds of wasps busy pollinating away, drinking the nectar. Um, so th so they, they do good. Um, and, you know, the, the, this tiny bit of annoyance they may occasionally cause when they decide to invade your picnic is, is uh, inconsequential compared to the positive things they do. Yeah, I must admit, I'm a, probably a bit of a lazy gardener. And I noticed, uh, well, I didn't get around to netting my cabbages uh, last year. And uh, I saw quite a lot of um, butterflies flying around. Um, but didn't see any caterpillars, but I did catch quite a few wasps hanging around my cabbages. So I was wondering if perhaps that was um, that was what had got rid of them, which is a bit of a first, actually. I've caught birds taking the caterpillars as well before. So, yeah, I tend to leave stuff and other things can polish them off generally. 
Um, you were talking quite a bit about the state of um, our grasslands and the kind of green desert um, that you showed us. Um, and Simon Bates was wondering um, whether we should sort of use a different vocabulary instead of saying improved grasslands, uh, which tends to have quite a positive spin. Um, should we be using things like degraded grasslands? Would that be helpful in that? <laughs> I, 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 that's a really good idea. I mean, I, I wince every time I use the phrase improved grasslands because I don't regard them as in any way an improvement. But that's just what they've sort of been become known as. Um, it would be great, actually, to, to recognise that, that they are far from improved, certainly from a biodiversity perspective, they're a disaster. Uh, so, yeah, if we could somehow rebrand them, then uh, maybe that would um, pave the way to, to them becoming slightly less frequent in the countryside. You never know. Yeah, I think the sort of rebranding or the way that we talk about things is is quite um, important, really. And um, Paul Butter has asked how we persuade farmers and the general public um, that a neat landscape is impoverished rather than a green and pleasant land. And I know this can often apply to um, sort of verge management. And you had that beautiful picture of the wildflower verges, but often councils get complaints when the grass grows more than an inch high and things and people have a very fixed view. I, I don't know how we kind of address that really. I, I think it I mean, it, is a, it will take time and is partly about educating people, making explaining to them. So um, a really simple thing is, is signage. You know, if, if you're going to leave an area in a park um, to grow long, put a sign up saying wildflower meadow and then it's it's more it's clear that it's not laziness. It's actually a positive step rather than the council can't be bothered to mow. And also, it's a little trick that I discovered um, helps. If you mow a, a path through an area of long grass and stick a sign up saying wildflower meadow, it suddenly looks the whole thing looks like it's being managed, and people are much less likely to complain about it. Um, rather than just leaving the whole lot to go long and, and with no explanation as to why it's like that. So, you know, I think once people realise that, that it, it's, you know, being done for positive reasons, they're much less likely to complain. Of course, some people will still probably complain, and uh, um, that's, that's, uh, that's going to be a hard one to get everyone on board. But, uh, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting issue. And I, I, but I think we, people's minds are already changing. You know, there's, there's a... The awareness of the value of not cutting verges, particularly since lockdown last spring, when there were lots of verges that suddenly burst into flower, and there were, as well as a few complaints, there were lots of people saying, "Isn't it beautiful? I've seen all these flowers that I never saw before." Um, and we just need to make sure the positive voices outweigh the negative ones, I guess. Yeah, and hopefully it will become the sort of new normal with a bit of luck eventually, when there's a tipping point. Um, going back to your um, point about the poor farmers in China having to hand pollinate their, their flowers, their trees. Um, Catherine Heyman wonders whether they could possibly reintroduce bees um, into those areas. Is that something that you know is being tried or is it even possible? I, I would, I'm sure it would be possible, assuming, the, you know, they changed their practices so they didn't just all die. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, but China's not the easiest place to to visit. I, I I have tried to get permission to go to this part of China, but it's it's um, a rather secretive country, and they they we don't really know what's happening. Those pictures were taken more than a decade ago, and I've been completely unable to find out what's happening there. Now maybe they've already reintroduced bees. I I don't know. Um, mm. I'd love to be really fascinating to follow up, but not easy to do. Do you know if that's happened anywhere else, any other countries other than China? Because that's a sort of classic example, isn't it? But are there other places where they've lost? Yeah, I've um, seen um, farmers in um, Bengal, um, which isn't actually so far from that region of southwest China. Uh, so that's northeast India, uh, hand pollinating uh, their vegetable crops um, just a couple of years ago. Um, and I've been told that it's happening in parts of Brazil um, as well. But so there are sort of these worrying reports of it cropping up, you know, more frequently around the world. And uh, but hardly surprising, unfortunately, given the ongoing decline of.
pollinators, it's inevitable at some point that, that there won't be enough unless we, you know, can turn things around. Yes, yeah, turn the tide a bit. Um, there's quite a lot of chat about gardening, as you might expect. Um, Shah loves gardening, but she doesn't really like watching the caterpillars munching their way through her veggies and flowers. Um, and she says, what can you know, what can you do about that? We sort of touched on that a little bit. Um, I wonder if there's a sort of a more broad approach you might suggest. I mean, there's no, sorry, this is a, a, how to control pests in, you know, in general in the garden. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, I think so. I, yeah. His hand went for a minute. Um, I mean, broadly, my, my attitude is is that we should accept a little bit of loss and not get too uptight if there's a few nibbles here or there. Um, sometimes, I mean, some pests are are tricky. You know, I've had my cabbages um, destroyed by by um, white butterflies before now, and it is frustrating. But there's usually some kind of solution that doesn't involve spraying. Well, there's always something you can do. With, with butterflies, keeping them off with netting is, I find, is by far the simplest solution. Um, but more broadly, um, encouraging a nice, diverse community of natural enemies, um, things like attracting hoverflies in by growing um, flowers that are attractive to them near the plants that may have aphids on them, and then the hoverflies will lay their eggs and their larvae will consume the aphids for you, which is essentially companion planting, um, uh, that works. Um, to some extent, it won't probably get rid of every aphid. But as I think I said, um, you want a few pests. That's, that's good, that's a stable situation. If there are a few pests and a few predators, then you've got a healthy garden and you should find that you can grow lots of fruits and veg and pretty flowers without having big outbreaks of pests. If you just kind of manage to reach that position of balance with lots of diversity, yeah, sure. I think, yeah, that seems to be the key thing, doesn't it? Having a nice mix of um, trees and shrubs and habitats in your garden and no pesticides. Um, I know the um, the flea treatment one, I've sort of heard a few discussions around this. Um, it's quite hard sometimes to find alternatives. People have posted up quite a few of their thoughts about that. But there was um, one lady, Alice, who's actually a vet who often advises the use of advocate, um, but wants to know if there's evidence that the tablet forms of flea prevention, which contain fluoral... Oh, Fluorolena, yeah. Fluorolena, yes, um, thank you. They, they have any better? We don't really know because they are also probably excreted from the animal, but in, in its urine and feces rather than when it gets wet because they're inside rather than outside. Um, there hasn't been really much research done on them and whether they're better. Um, I, I mean, my, I would say it's a bit of a complicated subject, but broadly, we shouldn't be using them prophylactically. We shouldn't be treating dogs who haven't got fleas or cats that haven't got fleas. I think that's a really silly thing that vets shouldn't have started doing. Sorry if you're a vet listening, but um, as I said, it's like taking antibiotics to avoid getting ill. It doesn't make any sense in the long term. Um, so we should only treat animals that actually have fleas. And in the winter in particular, it, fleas are much less common. So treating year round doesn't make much sense. Also hygiene, if you wash the beds and hoover under the beds regularly, um, the, the larval stages of fleas don't live on the on the animal, they live in, in the bedding. Um, so killing that stage is, can be a really simple way forward. And some people swear by, I don't know whether this is true, but you can get, um, uh, um, uh, uh, herbal remedies. There's one which sounds ridiculous. It's called Billy No Mates, um, but it's a, it's a it's a dog food, and I think there's a cat food version which supposedly makes your pet unattractive to fleas. And I know people who swear by it. I can't say that I, I you know I don't know whether there's any scientific proof, but it's worth a try. It would seem to me. It is. It was one of the ones that somebody had suggested. There was a whole range of herbal remedies that popped up in the chat box for that one. Um, we've we've got a little bit of time. Um, one of the things that obviously you talked about quite a lot was about the use of neonic pesticides, which um, had been banned in the EU, and we'd supported that here. Um, I had heard that France had somewhat 
done a bit of a um, backward step with that. And we've been told that our environment minister has just approved the use of this in the UK. We've been told it's a bit of a one-off emergency um, use for sugar beet. But I wondered, uh, and as you say, it's been quite topical and all over Facebook and the news recently. I wondered in terms of the sort of impact of that, whether you had a bit more to elaborate and whether there was anything that people can do. So any of our viewers. Uh, this, is a, this is a complicated one, but um, I, neonics were banned in 2018, uh, quite rightly, but um, all countries have been allowed to grant what they call derogations. So if farmers can make a case that there's an emergency and there's no alternative, and persuade the government that that is true, then, then they can grant an exemption from the ban. And various countries have done this. For, they, all, they all have to be one-off exemptions um, for a particular year. Um, and th there have been quite a few of them dotted around Europe, but, but the ban is in place and use of neonics has massively declined as a result of that ban. Um, I think it's really sad that, that our government has backtracked and has allowed this, this derogation on sugar beet in the UK. You know, these things were banned for good reason. Um, because they're incredibly poisonous to all insect life. They're really persistent. Once they get into the soil, they stay there for years. They leach into rivers um, and kill aquatic life. They get into wildflowers and hedgerow plants and kill bees and so on. Um, and that's why they were banned. And so it seems really daft. And so a couple of things that people might have heard. One is that it's beet is a non-flowering crop, so there's not a problem because bees don't visit it. Well, specifically the ban in, in 2018 was of the use of neonics on non-flowering crops because it had become clear that this broad-scale environmental contamination was leading to bees being exposed anyway by feeding on any flowers that grew anywhere near the contaminated soil that the crop had been grown in. So it, they don't have to feed on the crop directly to be poisoned. The, but this particular derogation, there's a, there's, a, there's a different angle on this. Sugar is a crop with essentially zero nutritional value. It's really bad for us. We all know, I talked about this a few minutes ago, we all know that we have poor diets and we have an obesity epidemic and a diabetes epidemic. Well, one of the main reasons for that is we consume way too much sugar. So if you just step back for a minute, we're here allowing the use of a chemical that we know will harm the environment so that we can prop up production of a product that we know is really bad for our health. Um, that farmer, the, the, the farmers that have got this derogation, sugar beet is grown on pretty fertile soil. A lot of it's in the fens in East Anglia, land that could be used to grow something nutritious, fruits and vegetables, the things that we don't grow enough of, that in the UK we import huge amounts of. So it would seem to me that it would be a much better solution to support those farmers in moving to growing better, healthy crops and trying to persuade the public one way or another to reduce sh sugar consumption. We've already got a sugar tax on fizzy drinks to do exactly that. You know, why, on the one hand, the government has got a sugar tax to stop us eating too much sugar. And on the other, it's, it's allowing farmers to use a pesticide so they can produce more sugar. It doesn't make any sense at all to me. So, sorry, this is a long rant and I could go on even further, but we'll run out of time. Um, it seems like a really crazy idea and I think we need to do something about it. We need to complain. There are already three petitions, if people can be bothered to sign them. There's an official government one, change.org have got one, and the Wildlife Trusts have got a slight, it's, it looks like a petition when you go to it, um, but actually it, all, it generates a letter to your MP um, explaining what the issue is and saying that you want them to, to U-turn and, and undo this derogation. And I would really urge people to, to, to do that um, so that our MPs are all bombarded with letters saying we do not want neonicotinoids being used in this country. Um, so that, it's nice to see actually that, that you know, the environmental movement seems to have mobilised itself in a pretty big way over this. The, the change petition got something like 160,000 signatures in about three days, which is extraordinary. Um, so yeah, um, join in, do your bit, sign as many petitions as you can get your hands on and make a noise and maybe we can turn this around.
Cool. If we can find the links, Donna, we could stick them in the um, in the chat thing there if people want the links to some of those things that Dave's just mentioned. Um, we're kind of just about coming up to the end. There's um, could have a have a, a a nice little finish off in terms of back to gardens um, and about the role of them sort of in a wider perhaps more landscape scale about the role that gardens play in linking up habitats as well perhaps yeah well so i mean obviously the 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 more meadow project is all about you know trying to recreate and restore these beautiful meadows that we lost so much of um but sadly you know we're not going to be able to to recreate seven million hectares of them as we used to have in the uk so there's never going to be a kind of uh, a continuous sea of flowers across the UK, but we can join up the meadows we can create by making our gardens full of flowers and uh, supporting wildlife there and by also um, badgering our councils to change the way we've talked about road verges and roundabouts and all these other areas which provide kind of linear connections between the towns and villages. So. You know, in my kind of ideal world, we, we restore as many hay meadows as we can. We manage the, the nature reserves that we have left and then we link them all up um, by making our gardens full of bee friendly flowers and, uh, and, and by badgering the council. And so collectively, all those different wildlife friendly habitats could make a kind of national network. Um, and, and in case people wonder why it's important that habitats are connected, there's really good scientific evidence that isolated habitats, no matter how wonderful they might be, if they're cut off and the inhabitants of those patches are completely cut off from other populations, they will slowly dwindle and die. They're not really viable long term. Nature reserves are much more effective if they're linked to other nature reserves, basically. And uh, as, as you say, Tracy, then, we, you know, we can all play a part in providing little stepping stones between the bigger patches of of, of meadow or, or whatever else it might be um, mm. that's, um nature and gardens of course make up actually a huge area of our national landscape anyway so if we were to see that transformed it would make a significant contribution i think well we've um we've come to the end of our time so I just want to say thanks ever so much. That was really, really interesting and um, prompted an awful lot of um, interesting discussion as well. More questions than we could have time to answer, but I suspect that might happen. Um, so, yeah, just just to finish to say thanks very much, Dave, and also thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, Donna is just going to wrap up for us. I think she's got a couple of things to say about some talks coming up um so we'll bring bring her in Hi. and i'll hand over to donna thank you thank you tracy and thank you very much Dave. that was such an interesting talk i mean are there are so many things you say that actually are shocking to hear but we do need to hear them um and good that actually there is something we can do you say those things we can do to help our insects um and just thanks to everybody who's joined us tonight and let you know about our next talk. Um, you can find out on our on the More Meadows website a bit more, more details. But just to say that the next talk is on the 3rd of February um, at 7.30. And we've got Stephen Moss, who's one of um, Britain's leading nature writers. And he's a broadcaster and wildlife producer. And he's going to talk to us um, on why meadows matter and why we need more of them. So we hope that many of you will be able to join us for that talk too. Okay, and thank you very much. And just, to just a again. little comment, I thought actually, Donna, before we go, is, is a lot of that really interesting stuff that you were talking about at the end there, Dave, about gardens and linking stuff up and managing verges. It's the sort of information we've got quite a lot of already on the forum. So if people are working on those kind of projects, then do take a look and we've got the web address at the bottom. Sorry, Donna. <laughs> no, good point. Thank you for reminding people. Excellent. Okay. So, okay. Should we okay. we'll say goodbye to everybody and thank you yeah. for joining us. Goodbye okay. and see you all soon. Thanks okay. very much. Bye.